Okay, everybody, how's everything going? As well as could be expected at this point? You guys going to give me all kinds of ideas for the exam today? Haven't written it yet. No, I haven't written it. Should I? No? That means everybody's happy with their grade at this point? You take it, you take it as it is? What's the fun in that? <laughs> yes, 40% of your grades in the final. So, um, yeah. It's the first three are each worth 20 and the last one's worth 40. Nope, nope, 40%. So there's a good chance to make up deficiencies there, right? There's also a good chance to... Why am I laughing? That's not funny. <laughs> you guys are laughing. I'm not laughing. <laughs> laughing through our tears. So how's it coming along? You wish, you wish there was more material we could put on it? No. A lot of material. How many made their note cards? You made your note cards already. Okay. Already got it planned out then. Well, where should we start? What's that? That was, that was an auspicious day to, to start the term, wasn't it? It seems like a long time ago, but it actually wasn't that long. Time does fly when you're having fun. What's that? Yes. It's funny, the term always seems to be compressed. The first part goes fast, the last part goes fast, but the middle part just seems to go forever. I don't quite know why. But everything is relative, I guess. All right, so what are we going to do? Okay. Okay, so the question was on the first exam, there was a question that said, How do you calculate KCAT using an equation? And she's unsure what the equation is. So the equation was actually quite simple. Um, KCAT is determined as, if you remember, we, we wanted to have something that was a measure for um, uh, the speed of an enzyme that was independent of the amount of the enzyme. And we said that Vmax wouldn't do that because Vmax depended upon the amount of the enzyme. If we doubled the amount of enzyme, we would double the Vmax. And so Vmax doesn't give us that um, measure that we want. So KCAT um, does do that. And the way it does it is it uh, cancels out the concentration of the enzyme. So uh, KCAT, the equation that you're asking about, KCAT is determined as Vmax divided by the concentration of the enzyme that was used um, in the uh, set of reactions and that will give KCAT. That means that the enzyme concentration cancels itself out uh, of the equation, and you're left with a number. And the number that you get is the number of molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per time, usually, usually given as one second. So a KCAT of 100,000 would mean 100,000 molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per second. See, everybody came here to hear everybody else's questions. Uh, if I can remember which one that, that I, we gave that name to. Oh, oh, the unsaturated fatty acids. Okay. We've given names. Every, every term I give different enzymes different names, and so I never remember. Plus, I'm an old guy. So, uh, Yes, Dina was in fatty acid metabolism. And, uh, or Dina, 
Um, and that was right here. Okay. So when we look at the oxidation of unsaturated fatty acids, um, as I said in class, people tend to um, look at these as um, very different from saturated fatty acids. But in fact, oxidation of unsaturated fatty acids uses the same enzymes as um, saturated fatty acids. That is the same thing as beta oxidation. The only difference being that there are two additional enzymes that are used to um, oxidize unsaturated fatty acids. The easier of the two uh, enzymes was the um, first one that I gave you, which was uh, this guy right here, which is enoyl, I'm sorry, which is enoyl coa isomerase. Enoyl coa, -CoA isomerase converts um, bonds that are in positions 3, 4 in the cis into positions 2, 3 that are in the trans. And once you've done that, then you have an intermediate in beta oxidation. So, where's my pointer? Okay. So, you have this guy right here, which is a normal intermediate in beta oxidation. It'll continue along, and then the next step in the beta oxidation of this guy would involve addition of water to put a hydroxyl uh, right here, and then oxidation to make it a ketone, and then uh, finally breaking of it off uh, with thiolase. Okay, now that this isn't always the position, that is right here, isn't always the position that double bonds come in. So if you have um, them coming in in a different position, then you have to, you have to use the other enzyme. So the other enzyme uh, was the one we called Dyna. Is that blurry to, it was just me. That is, it is blurry, isn't it? Okay. I can't focus the projector, I don't think. Uh, focus. Doing a bloody thing. Hmm. All right, let's try to focus. Nope, not doing anything. All right. All right. Anyway, um, so. Uh, this depicts a situation where we've gone through some beta oxidation and we get to a place where we have uh, fatty acids uh, with the double bond in the wrong position. So, for example, here we have positions two and three. Uh, we started out with three and four. We made it two and three, so we've got the enoyl coa isomerase. It um, moves them appropriately so we can oxidize that. When we oxidize that, we get down here to this situation where we now have a double bond between positions one, two, three, four, and five. So between positions four and five, we've got a, a cis double bond and we want to oxidize it. The first step in the process, uh, oxidation continues as uh, it would in beta oxidation. That is, the uh, first enzyme takes out um, two protons, two electrons, and makes a, a trans bond between positions two and three. However, uh, the next enzyme in the process can't um, handle this substrate. So that's where the second enzyme, that is the next enzyme in the beta oxidation pathway, can't handle this substrate. Um, the, this enzyme, the, the, what we call Dyna, uh, comes in, and it does something interesting. It takes these two double bonds, and it converts them, okay, from being two double bonds like this to being one double bond, all right, in the cis configuration between carbons three and four, all right. Now, that is critical because that configuration is exactly what enoyl coa isomerase can do, can handle. It takes that cis three four and converts it into a trans two three, and then beta oxidation continues. So all it's doing is you've got two possible situations. You've either got a double bond between positions three and four, or you've got a double bond between positions four and five. If you've got it between three and four, you can oxidize it solely with the enoyl coa isomerase. If you have it between positions four and five, you will need this um, uh, Dyna enzyme uh, to ultimately make um, the right substrate for the, uh, the enoyl coa isomerase. Does that make any more sense than before? Charisma? Yes. Okay. Right. So why does a plant go through and do cyclic pho uh, photophosphorylation? The reason that a plant does that is it's got no more NADP. So if we remember, NADP is the terminal electron acceptor. 
And when it's got um, plenty of NADP, it goes, th it goes through both photosystems. The electrons end up um, on the NADP, and you make NADPH. But when you run out of NADP, then all you've got is NADPH. You don't have any, any place to put those electrons. So rather than just stop everything like what happens in oxidative phosphorylation if we don't have any, aid, if we don't have any uh, electron carrier like uh, oxygen, all right, uh, instead of just stopping that process, the electrons are shunted backwards through that uh, transport system. That allows for the continued pumping of protons even though um, there's no NADP. The advantage of that being a proton gradient can be used to make ATP. So that's the primary advantage of that. And as I said in class, this happens a lot with plants on a very sunny day. So today, those plants out there are doing a lot of cyclic photophosphorylation because they've loaded up all their NADPH during the daytime. Uh, there's been plenty of sunlight to do that. And they um, uh, would otherwise be wasting the energy of the sun right now if they weren't doing photophosphorylation. So that's, that's why they do it. If to answer your question. Well, there is. That's actually a very good, very good uh, question. So his question was, is, isn't it because that there's energy coming into the plant, they have to do something to dissipate that energy? And, and you're exactly right. There is uh, a component of that. Um, and there's a, a professor on campus who actually studies that. It's a very interesting uh, phenomenon that that energy coming in has to be dealt with in some way. So it does help to dissipate the energy. But moreover, it also helps to make ATP when um, you, you don't have electron uh, uh, acceptors. Um, I wouldn't compare it to doing fermentation, no. No. Because we're doing it there because we need the energy. Here they're doing it because uh, A, they're dissipating energy, which is coming in, which is too much for them. And two, they're, they're, con they're continuing to make ATP, but they don't need to make the ATP. I mean, they're not, you know, we're doing it. We're doing it because we have to keep muscle cells going, for example. So I wouldn't compare it to, to fermentation, no. Question? No. So that's, that, that's what he's asking. Is, is it the same as fermentation? It's not. So we're doing fermentation because um, we need to have the energy. These guys have plenty of energy at this point. So that's, that's not the reason that they're doing that, no. Yes, sir. Uh, can you redefine ketogenic and glutogenic? Ketogenic and glutogenic. Okay, glucogenic. So ketogenic uh, basically relates to making intermediates that uh, go through acetyl-CoA. That's basically what it means. Okay. So um, glucogenic makes means it makes uh, th that it's uh, so, so ketogenic is uh, when, when I say it, I'm talking about amino acid metabolism. It's a type of amino acid metabolism that makes intermediates uh, related to acetyl-CoA. All right. So those intermediates might go to the citric acid cycle. Those, might, those intermediates might go to other things like fatty acid synthesis, uh, et cetera. Okay? But that's what ketogenic means. Glucogenic means that um, the amino acid uh, breakdown pathway is making intermediates that are uh, involved in either the synthesis or breakdown of glucose. And that's what glucogenic means. Yes? Um, what's the difference between C3 and C4 plants? What's the difference between C3 and C4 plants? That probably I should try to explain with a figure. Okay. Oh, I need photosynthesis uh, there. Okay. So um, the difference between C3 and C4 plants um, is really right here. Okay. If we were to slice this guy off right here and get rid of this malate uh, component, and what, what, what we would have is we would have ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. We would have CO2 coming into this cell. And we would run the Calvin cycle and make glucose. That's what a C3 plant does. Okay? A C4 plant has simply figured out a way to concentrate the CO2 without losing the water that it would otherwise have to do to get that CO2. Okay? So it does it by uh, using this um, carboxylation reaction out here that grabs the um, carbon dioxide and puts it onto PEP to make exaloacetate, and then transports that, s that, that four, four carbon molecule into this cell where the, um, uh, where the Calvin cycle is going on and drops off the CO2. 
So consequently, the CO2 is being dropped off in a place where there's not water, for example, that's that, that potentially can be lost. And as a consequence, this helps to concentrate the CO2 um, and makes this cycle more efficient than if it were occurring out here. So that's, that's really what the difference between the C3 and the C4 plant uh, is. Yes, sir. Well, so these uh, evolved under, trop uh, under um, tropical and, and, and fairly dry conditions where uh, there was an advantage to those that were losing water. If you were in the Pacific Northwest where you had plenty of water, it probably wouldn't be to your advantage to do that. Okay. So, no, I, I would say the answer is that not, not all plants would necessarily have evolved. Uh, to obviously, they haven't evolved to do that. And they wouldn't want to, I don't, I don't okay. think, either. Yeah. Is that a question? Okay. Yeah, is there a disadvantage to doing that? You know, I'm not a botanist. I probably I shouldn't try to answer that question. My gut feeling is that there probably is, at some level, disadvantage uh, to doing that, but I, I couldn't tell you what that is. I don't know. Yeah. Still, still going on in the chloroplast, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I don't think, it, I mean, you're, you're right, it could be. I, I just don't know how, um, how much of a, of a barrier that, that, that layer is. I just don't know. <coughs> My wife's a botanist. I should, I should bring her to answer the question for you. In fact, she's home b playing botanist, working in the garden. She loves to work in the garden. Yes, sir. Okay, so the uh, question was, um, how is it that 2,3-BPG uh, gets used when you're exercising, I think is, is the question. So um, I don't have a figure for that, so I'll have to explain it to you in words. But that the simple answer to the question is that 2,3-BPG um, is produced by rapidly metabolizing cells, all right? So you saw that it was a byproduct of the product of, of the, of the um, pathway of glycolysis. And the more glycolysis runs, the more 2,3-BPG will be produced as a byproduct. So it's a byproduct of the pathway. It's not a main product, but it's a byproduct of the pathway. So in the body, 2,3-BPG is therefore a flag that says here is where uh, rapidly me rapid metabolism is going on, okay? So if, I'm, if I have a, you know, this, this arm, I'm doing this, and the other arm sitting here doing nothing, my right arm, which is doing the exercising, is going to uh, be producing 2,3-BPG, the left arm isn't going to be doing that, okay? So when the hemoglobin, which goes now out uh, carrying oxygen throughout my body, hits my right arm, okay, it's going to get a dose of 2,3-BPG. It hits my left arm, it's not going to get as much of a dose of 2,3-BPG <coughs> because it's not doing anything. 2,3-BPG, when it binds to hemoglobin, causes hemoglobin to flip into the T state, and in the T state, that's where it lets go of oxygen, okay? So this guy over here is... Uh, getting uh, release of oxygen as a consequence of the fact that it's producing 2,3-BPG. This guy over here isn't getting as much oxygen, and that makes very good sense because this guy doesn't need it as much as this guy over here does, okay? Once the hemoglobin has dropped off its oxygen, it's gotten the 2,3-BPG, it then uh, travels back uh, in the direction of the lungs so that it can uh, go get more oxygen. Well, it's bound to 2,3-BPG, uh, when it leaves uh, this muscle cell, or these muscle cells on, on my, my right arm. Um, but along the way, th it's like any other binding. It's not a covalent binding that's happening here. So there's an on-off, on-off nature to the binding. Sometimes when it comes off, instead of going back to the hemoglobin, it gets grabbed by a cell. And so the cell grabs the 2,3-BPG, and it can actually use it for energy because, remember, it's an intermediate of glycolysis. So it could take that 2,3-BPG, it could oxidize it farther, 
and use that uh, for energy inside of, it, uh, inside of the cell that grabs it. Well, you go far enough um, and it's going to be much more likely that that 2,3-BPG is going to be out of the hemoglobin by the time it gets back to the lungs. And consequently, when it gets back to the lungs, there's nothing in the lungs that's going to lock the hemoglobin in the, the T state. Okay? It's still in the T state when it gets back to the lungs. It's still in the T state, but there's nothing locking it there. Okay? So when it binds that first oxygen, that's when we see cooperativity. We see that hemoglobin flips from the T state into the R state, and now that's when it gets loaded up with oxygen again. Okay? So at that point, you've completed the cycle uh, in going from a fully oxygenated form to dumping the oxygen to coming back and getting more. So that's, that's what's happening with 2,3-BPG. Okay? Yes? Okay. Um, so there are three steps that I'm confused about, and I don't know what they connected to. Okay. The first one is um, how to identify a bacteria that takes the collagen. Okay. Okay. So the question was uh, relating to the biotechnology uh, section of exam three, and one of the questions I asked was how is it that we can tell uh, the bacteria that get the plasmid? Okay. Well, the answer to that question is, well, first of all, I'll tell you why we're, we're concerned about that. We're, we're concerned about that because only a very tiny percentage of any of the bacteria will get a plasmid if we give it to them, all right? So something like about one in 100,000 cells will get a plasmid if we uh, put it out there for the cells to take, okay? We actually have to treat the cells to make them to take it up. So it's a very inefficient process. If we don't have a way of identifying which ones get the plasmid, then 99,999 9, of them are going to do nothing for us, and one is going to do something for us. We're not going to get very much product. Okay? So we want to be able to see which ones have the plasmid. Well, we make that very simple by taking the plasmid that we give to the cells and putting a gene in the plasmid that gives resistance to an antibiotic. So the gene that gives resistance to the antibiotic now um, helps us to identify the cells that get the plasma because we simply treat all the cells with the antibiotic. Only those that get the plasma will live. All the other cells that don't get the plasma will die. And now we've got uh, a pile of cells that all of which have the plasma. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, you had others. And then my, the next one is um, the fifth step to determine if the bacteria make RNA of the gene in the brain. Okay. So how do we ensure that the bacteria make RNA of the gene that we've inserted into the plasmids? I mean, we, we, we um, wanted to have these bacteria make a protein for us, and so how do we ensure that that happens? Well, that actually came about during the design of the, of the plasmid that we use. The plasmid that we use is called an expression vector, and the expression vector has several features about it. One is it has an antibiotic resistance marker like we've already talked about. Two, it has a replication uh, origin, and three, it has a promoter that will be used to transcribe RNA. So that was part of the design feature of the plasmid itself. Well, the, the plasma would have all those features in there. That's correct. So how would, I, how would I purify this protein that I've made away from all the other uh, proteins? Well, the method I talked about in class was called histidine tagging. And histidine tagging, again, um, I had to plan that. I had to make a plasmid that not only had a promoter, but it also had a sequence in it that would put a, si a series of histidines at either the carboxyl or the amino terminus of the protein. The reason for doing that is that this sequence of several histidines in a row um, will um, bind to uh, a, a nickel. So if I take a column that I make and it has nickel sticking out on it, when I take and I bust open the cells and I pour the mixture of all the different proteins through uh, the column, what will happen is the proteins that have a histidine tag, which will be the ones that I put into the cell, will um, bind to the nickel column, and all the cellular proteins, which don't have that histidine tag, will just go sh shooting through the column. 
and then I can wash off the um, um, uh, protein that I wish uh, by adding histidine uh, to the column, and that therefore the the, uh, the protein lets go. Okay. Uh, typically in a laboratory, somebody would have already made those. Somebody had to build them. But yeah, yeah. So it's it's really a question of a design feature more than, more than anything. So they're, they're fully synthetic, just not a natural enzyme. They're fully synthetic. That's right. Uh, what they do in making plasmids um, is you take pieces of natural things. So for example, a replication origin. You can you can get a replication origin from a plasmid in nature. Okay, so you pop that out. You might say, why, why don't you use a plasmid in nature? Well, uh, we've sort of optimized things to make them work the way we want. Uh, we've made the, the origins be more efficient by doing a, a few manipulations. We've put, uh, we've made them smaller. So the plasmids that occur in nature will typically be fairly large. And the larger the plasmid is, the harder it is to get it into cells. So there's a lot of reasons for manipulating it. But we take these various pieces and put them together to make that. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So we didn't understand the significance of the CDP diisoglycerol in the process of making phosphatidyl compounds. Uh, there's not a great significance. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that. Uh, so, uh, well, hear me out. Hear me out. There, there was a reason for telling it, uh, telling you about it. Uh, part of which is that that is the way in which you make, or one of the ways in which you make phosphatidyl compounds. But more importantly, I talked about it in the cell as an example of the fact that. All four of the nucleotides are involved in very important biochemical processes inside the cell. So I talked about s how CDP is used to make phosphatidyl compounds, which are important for membranes, how UDP is used to make glycogen, uh, which is important, obviously, for storing energy, how GTP is used for making proteins, and how ATP is used for essentially everything else uh, in inside the cell. And because of that, um, cells have a real barometer on their state of energy um, and so forth when they have to make that important decision about to divide or not to divide. So um, those four things together, which of course go together to make RNA and then ultimately to make DNA uh, as well, really are fairly easy for the cell to measure because if you are you know, very, very rapidly, very busily making membrane um, lipids, for example, with which you would be with, with doing CDP uh, diisoglycerol, your concentrations of CTP might be very low. So therefore, uh, this might be uh, a flag that says, hey, we're not ready to go forward yet, right? So this intimate tying together of the nucleotides to the very important cellular processes really do tell cells things. So the question is, does, does P53 monitor cell division by monitoring the levels of nucleotides? The answer is basically no. Uh, so P53 is monitoring uh, the progression of the process of replication itself and the proper completion of it. And it's a very complicated process. Um, there are proteins called cyclins that are involved in um, helping the cell to progress through these <coughs> various phases uh, of cell division. And they actually communicate. Um, and communicate w with each other and with, with P53 in, in, in order to help the cell make that decision. So uh, P53 is not looking directly at nucleotides, no. Yes? Um, so if you think that those are um, not unreasonable things, um, maybe you think they're unreasonable, but <laughs> I, I mean, um, so, you know, you've got five carbon building blocks, you've got, they, they make a 10, you've got 10 that makes 15, you've got 15 that makes 30, and 30 becomes cholesterol at some point, you know, I, so I don't, you know, th that's what, five names, six names, yeah. Yes. Okay. 
very good question. So is the question about ATP synthase, is the rotational energy of the ATP synthase uh, driven by the concentration of protons? The answer is absolutely yes, absolutely. Just like the, the water turning the turbine, it goes from higher to lower. It's exactly the same thing that's happening with the uh, protons. Yep. It's not constantly going, no. So it will slow down as, you, as your uh, proton gradient um, uh, dissipates. Yes? Okay, so you're asking actually a very complicated question, but, I'll, but I'll, I'll, I'll answer it for you since you've asked. It's more than you will need to know for an exam. How's that? Well, maybe you don't want to know. Well, no, you, you, you're here to learn. You want to learn, right? So um, her question was, how is it that, that palmitic acid is inhibiting acetyl-CoA carboxylase if palmitic acid is being used to make fat inside of fat cells, okay? Um, the simple answer to the question, which is what I will give you here, the simple answer to the question is if palmitic acid is being used to make fat, and the cell is still putting away fat, then palmitic acid concentrations will stay low and the enzyme will continue churning out more things, okay? So if there were more of a control on that, we would probably never get obese because um, what would happen is our palmitic acid concentrations would get high enough um, that it would stop the, the production of that and we wouldn't be storing all this, this stuff away as energy. But that doesn't happen because palmitic acid is getting gobbled up and being put away as fat. Now, imagine, if you will, that I go out and I, I go on my diet, uh, which I have to go on about once a year. I go on my diet to drop that weight. My fatty acids get starting to be cleaved off of that fat, okay? What are they going to do to my acetyl-CoA carboxylase? Well, they're going to inhibit it, and that makes very good sense that they should inhibit it at that point because I'm not getting enough energy to keep everything else going, right? So I don't want to be wasting that energy making additional fat because that's not going to do me any good. Does that make sense? So it actually makes more sense thinking of the palmitic acid uh, in terms of when you're breaking down fat than it does during the process of synthesizing fat. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Quick question. Is phosphatidic acid minus the phosphate equal to diisoglycerol? The answer is mathematically yes. Chemically, yes. Not mathematical, but equal signs. Yes? Okay. So our question is, acetyl-CoA can't cross the mitochondrial intermembrane barrier, but you see it both in the cytoplasm and in the matrix. Is that, is that your question? Okay. So how does that happen? Well, it happens because of the fact that you've got the shuttle. So the shuttle that happens that moves uh, that out is um, actually citrate. So citrate, um, let's go back to the cycle. Um, and I thought I had a citrate cycle. No, okay, I got it back up here, back up. It's up here. Okay, so uh, I don't like this figure a lot, but it, it does have the basics of what's there. Okay, so here's acetyl-CoA inside the matrix, all right? And if I have the situation I described in class where I'm sitting around eating pizza, drinking beer, watching the tube and doing nothing, then I am not going to have much ADP. I don't have much ADP. My ATP concentrations are high because I'm not exercising, I'm not doing my thing, all right? So, if I have very little ADP, then what's happening? I have little ADP. That means that the proton gradient is going to be very high because protons can't come back in. And when the proton gradient gets high, it's going to stop electron transport. When electron transport stops, then NADH is going to accumulate. I'm going to have no NAD. When I have no NAD, the citric acid cycle which uses NAD is going to stop, okay? Well, it's going to start, but it's not going to go to any reaction that uses NAD because that reaction is going to be stuck, okay? 
So the reactions that will go in the citric acid cycle include the very first one, where oxaloacetate combines with acetyl-CoA. That's a very energetically favorable reaction. And you make citrate, okay? So citrate gets made, but citrate can only go to isocitrate a little bit because isocitrate is plugged up by the next reaction. You're stuck, okay? So citrate then, as it starts to accumulate, gets transported out of the mitochondrion. There is a transport system for taking citrate out. And when it gets out, the reversal of the reaction occurs to split citrate into oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA. So what's happening is because we're not exercising, we're moving acetyl-CoA from the matrix out into the cytoplasm. And that's significant because acetyl-CoA gets made into fatty acids in the cytoplasm. That's where acetyl-CoA carboxylase is, and all this is going to happen out there. So that's, uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question properly, but that's why uh, we, we, we make note of that. Was that a question I saw back there? You're just scratching your ear. Yeah. So we're reversing that. Okay. So the reversal of that, you're moving fatty acids into the mitochondrial membrane, and it's actually carnitine is the, is the compound. But you've got, you've got a, an acyl-CoA, okay, that the cell has just gobbled up from the bloodstream, for example. So it's now pulling this, acid, this, this um, acyl-CoA in, and it gets down into here, and the acyl-CoA can't cross the membrane. So what happens is the uh, CoA is replaced by carnitine. It gets in. And then the carnitine is replaced by CoA again, and um, then oxidation of the fatty acid will occur. Okay? Yes, sir? How does the CoA get in there? How does the CoA get in there? Yeah. Okay, so mitochondria really are very interesting little structures. They've got plenty of enzymes in there for making a lot of things, one of which is CoA. Yeah. So they make CoA, they make NAD. They were their own entity. Uh, some of the genes that uh, the mitochondria has its own genes, and the reason for doing that is so that it can make some of these compounds that's there. Mitochondria are really interesting uh, because um, depending on the organism, the uh, movement of the genes has occurred to a limited extent or to a, lot, to a large extent from the mitochondrial genome into the cellular genome. But then that means if they make it into the cellular genome, then those, those mitochondrial proteins have to be transported into the mitochondrion. So that, that has to happen. Uh, so if we look at human beings, for example, um, we have a relatively small mitochondrial um, genome. We only have about 16,000 base pairs in ours. There are organisms that have oh, over 100,000 base pairs uh, in size of their mitochondrial genome. And chloroplasts, which also have their own DNA, have about, I think, about a quarter of a million base pairs. So yeah, so there's quite a, vari a variation in what's there. Everybody's thinking hard. Transaminations, yeah, yeah. So um, transaminations are very important uh, in the metabolism of uh, amino acids, and they're particularly important because that's how the nitrogens move from one molecule uh, to another. So um, let's see. Say it again. No, no, this transamination simply involves swapping of nitrogens for ketone groups. That's all it involves, okay? So um, we have uh, a transamination will always, always involve an amino acid and a keto acid. A keto acid is something that will have a ketone at position two next to a carboxyl, all right? So pyruvate is a keto acid. 
Oxaloacetate is a keto acid. Alpha ketoglutarate is a keto acid. All three of those are keto acids. Okay. Um, the swap occurs between the nitrogen and the oxygen. Okay. So in this case, I've got glutamate and I've got an alpha keto acid. I take off the nitrogen, I replace it with the oxygen. These two swap places. I end up with alpha ketoglutarate and an, a, an alpha amino acid. Okay. So that happens with every um, transamination that occurs. And this reaction, I, somebody asked me uh, outside of class about this. This reaction is actually a kind of a cool reaction because the enzyme, uh, these enzymes that do this um, uh, exist in two different states. Basically what the enzyme does is it shuttles back and forth between these two molecules, the nitrogen and the oxygen. So in one state, the nitrogen has an oxygen on it. In the other state, the, the, the enzyme has an oxygen on it. And so the enzyme goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, transporting those, um, those uh, nitrogens and oxygens from one molecule to the other. And it's interesting that, that this mechanism we refer to as a ping pong mechanism because the enzyme goes from here to here to here to here to do all that. It's kind of cool. I spared you that when we talked about enzymes. Yes? Yeah, we're not going to compare the, the, the which one's number one, two, three, four. Yeah, right. Uh, and that's where you use, um, I can't remember what you use, but it's like something like um, the Okay. Where you also have spectrum, and then you mentioned something about when you look at it over water, it's kind of like that. Okay. That well, let's go, let's go to the figure and see if I can answer the question for you. All right, so let's go to the figure. Um, okay. So, um, control is down here, and um, here. Okay, this th this is the thing you're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, here are the four states of the enzyme. All right. So you've got the enzyme with no phosphate, or with phosphate. And you've got the enzyme in either the T state or the R state. Okay, so a really good thing and an easy way to remember this is T and R only happen as a result of external molecules, allosterism. You can't convert T and R with a phosphate. It doesn't happen. Okay, so th putting a phosphate on has nothing to do with T and R. So that's why we draw it here, going this way. If this starts out as a T and I put phosphates on it, I end up with a T. If this has no phosphates on it and I put phosphates on it, it ends up as an R and it starts as an R. Okay? Now, your question uh, was, I think, over here, okay, relating to um, the glycogen phosphorylase A, that is the form that has the phosphates on it. And I think I said in class that people refer to glycogen phosphorylase A as being the more active form of glycogen phosphorylase. And the reason that we say that it's the more active form is it's much easier to get it down here into this state. This state is the most active, there's no question. And this state is the least active, there's no question. Okay? But getting it down here into this state is very trivial because as long as there's no glucose, it will automatically flip into this state. Only when glucose concentrations are increasing will it flip back here and then get the phosphate removed. Okay? So when will this happen? Well, this will happen when the cell has more glucose than it's burning. This will happen when the cell is importing glucose and it's not needing it any further. So when those conditions happen, you don't want to be activating this enzyme and breaking down more glycogen and making more glucose. You want to stop that process and that's uh, in fact, what this upwards reaction is in the process of doing. Does that make sense? So, but in the absence of that, as long as the cell is burning up the glucose it's getting, it's, if, it's, if it's in this uh, configuration, it's automatically going to flip into here and get more. Yeah? So it uses glucose for that. What's the energy source? Will it be the 
Well, ATP or G6P affect this form of the enzyme. Right, right, right. They won't affect the phosphorylated form. Yeah. I mean, this is a very interesting and, 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 and cool, I mean, you might not think it's cool as you're learning it, but it's a very cool system uh, that cells have evolved uh, to do this. And they do it because, as I said in class, that we really have to have some very fine level controls on this because these enzymes are really efficient. I mean, they can break down your glycogen just like that. And when you've got such a powerful tool, you don't want to have it just going willy-nilly crazy with stuff. You want to have it responding to the needs of the, of the organism. Uh, or the needs of the cell. And this really does that very, very well, uh, surprisingly well. Yes? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's let's go. Let's go. I throw those terms out, but sometimes um, I should spend more time talking about them. I think I was in a in a hurry to finish yesterday, <laughs> or Friday. Yeah. But anyway, let's let's go through and and, and, and do that. So, um, all right. So this is the figure I think that you're talking about, and I said that ribonucleotidase is the enzyme that um, converts ribonucleoside diphosphates into deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates. That's a mouthful of words, but it means it's a way for us to make deoxyribonucleotides. Okay? It's a way for us to make deoxyribonucleotides. We have, have to have a starting, and the starting material is a ribonucleotide. The end product is a deoxyribonucleotide. Okay? And the specific ribonucleotide we start with is a ribonucleoside diphosphate, meaning, as you said, ADP, GDP, CDP, or UDP. So that D meaning the diphosphate form. Okay? That's what we have um, to s as a starting material. All right. What the enzyme does, it, it doesn't care which one of those four it has. I'm exaggerating a little bit because the enzyme has some very interesting allosteric controls that I spared you. Okay? But for our purposes, we'll say it doesn't really matter which one it binds. What it does is once it binds to this ribonucleoside diphosphate is it catalyzes a reaction where that oxygen gets removed and you end up with a hydrogen instead of an OH. This guy right here is a deoxyribonucleotide. Okay? So if this was GDP, then this is going to be DGDP. If this was UDP, this is going to be DUDP, okay? Yeah, N is just a filler letter, meaning it stands for any. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I I throw those terms out and realize people have sometimes people haven't heard them before. So, but N stands for any of the nucleoside diphosphates. Okay. Okay. So what's DUMP? That's what your brain's going to do when this exam is done. Okay. So. DUMP stands for deoxyuridine monophosphate. All right. And the question would be, well, where will I get DUMP? You, you actually get it. You don't need to know this, but I'll, I'll tell you because it's an odd thing that the cell does. The cell, um, I'll just show you so it's kind of odd. Again, you're not responsible for this. But um, the cell goes from UDP to making DUDP. That's the ribonucleotide reductase reaction. Okay? And remember, at this point, we don't have any T's yet. That's why it's doing this with you. All right? So you've got DUDP, and then you've got NDPK, which will convert that guy into um, DUTP. Okay? And you might say, well, why in the world would you need DUTP? Right? And the fact of the matter is, you don't need DUTP. And in fact, you don't want to have DUTP. And the reason why? Because DNA polymerase will use this. It will put it into DNA. And over time, it's not as chemically stable as T. It's going to pose a problem. Okay? 
So instead, and again, you're not responsible for this, but I'll just show you how odd nucleotide metabolism is. Instead, the cell has an enzyme called a DUMPA, a D, I'm sorry, DUTPase that cleaves DUTP and makes DUMP. And it does that to keep this concentration low so that it doesn't make it into DNA. Then it takes this, and now you've got thymidylate synthase, which was the reaction I showed you in class, that makes DTMP. Okay? So this is still monophosphate. Well, then you've got a kinase that makes it DTDP, and then you've got NDPK again, which makes it DTTP, and then that goes to DNA. Yeah, what a convoluted pathway, right? What a convoluted pathway. And that's, that's how you make all your thymine nucleotides. Yeah. And uh, bacteria do it, humans do it. It goes throughout, throughout the, um, the um, life kingdoms. Yeah, pretty, pretty cool. Question? That's right, that's right. You don't need to know what's in, in the individual families of the amino acid metabolism, unless you want to. When I was a graduate student, I got exposed to meta a graduate level metabolism, and we had to learn every frigging um, amino acid me metabolic pathway. And remember the 19 steps in cholesterol biosynthesis I told you about? Yeah, I had to learn all that. That was, that was a real pain at one time. That was when I first, that was, that, that, was, that was the first time I got addicted to coffee. Yeah, it was like, man, I was drinking coffee out the wazoo. And I aced the exam, but by golly, it was a, it was a bear to, to learn. And I, I did the dump thing, too. My phone is buzzing me about something. Oh, okay, nothing that important. What's this? ketone body metabolism, okay? So, um, let's see, that would be back under, uh, carbohydrates, I believe. Or was it, was it under lipids? Maybe it was under lipids. Ketone body metabolism, okay, right there. Okay, so, in ketone body metabolism, um, the reason ketone body metabolism becomes um, critical is uh, when the body is low on glucose, okay? And that's important because glucose is needed by the brain, it's needed by your eyes, and the brain and the eyes can't make glucose. So it's dependent upon the liver to do that, and if for whatever reason either you are starving yourself or you have diabetes, and, and so why diabetes? Well, diabetes, remember you've got imbalances in insulin. So if you, um, what happens is in diabetes, your body, uh, when it tries to catch up, it makes a big slug of, of insulin. And so diabetics will fre frequently go hypoglycemic because insulin, when it gets in high concentrations, is now going to grab, cause cells to grab every molecule of glucose that it can. And so blood glucose levels go like this. So that's why in the diabetics that this becomes an important consideration. All right. So um, anyway. So we, do th we, we make ketone bodies so we can provide an alternative source of energy for the brain besides glucose. That's really the reason that we're doing this, okay? Um, we do it in an interesting series of reactions, the first reaction of which is the reversal of the very last step of beta oxidation. It's the reversal because there's the same enzyme as the last enzyme of beta oxidation, thiolase, and instead of taking a four carbon piece and breaking it into two twos, which we would be doing if we went upwards, instead we're taking two twos and we're converting them into a four carbon piece moving downwards, okay? We then add a third two carbon piece to make HMG-CoA, and it's this molecule that I said was the intermediate in the synthesis of cholesterol and in the uh, synthesis of ketone bodies. If we go cholesterol, we have HMG-CoA reductase, which goes to the right, and then we make that long, that make the five carbon, 10 carbon, 15 carbon, blah, 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 right? 
If you're making ketone bodies, instead, we move down here. And basically what we do is we clip off an acetyl-CoA. When we clip off an acetyl-CoA, we're left behind with this four-carbon piece called acetoacetate. And acetoacetate is a ketone body, but it's a relatively unstable ketone body. And unless it gets converted over here to this guy, if it stays as this guy, which it will to some extent in the bloodstream, then a small percentage of it will break down and decarboxylate and leave you with acetone. Okay? Well, that's what you worry about in the breath of a person because they may have diabetes if, if uh, you smell this in their breath. What the body is doing isn't trying to make this. It's actually trying to get these two compounds into the brain because in the brain, these guys cross the blood-brain barrier. They get to the brain and then the reversal of all these steps goes all the way back up here to make acetyl-CoA's. Well, acetyl-CoA, any cell can use for energy because acetyl-CoA can be burned in the, in the citric acid cycle. And so by making these two guys, what the body has done is it's found a way to deliver acetyl-CoA to the brain that doesn't involve glucose. Otherwise, it's dependent upon glucose to go through glycolysis, through pyruvate decarboxylation, and then you get acetyl-CoA. This way, it's getting acetyl-CoA without going through glucose. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Um, as far as I know, I think it happens in the, in the, the liver. The liver is involved in everything. It's a safe bet to say that if it's a process happening, it's probably happening in your liver. Yeah. You see why your liver, you know, why, why, you know, liver is so, such a critical organ. It's also an organ that regenerates itself to some extent. I think be, probably because it has to. Yeah. Okay. So his question is, what regulates ketone body um, generation? All right. Um, that's kind of a complicated question, actually. So um, with uh, respect to blood glucose will be one thing that will do that. Okay. So blood glucose levels going very low will send out a signal from the brain uh, saying, I'm needing some energy here. Uh, and that's the primary uh, signal. I don't know what the nature of that signal is, though, to be honest with you. It's hormonal, but I don't know what the hormone is. Actually, I, actually, let me back up on that. I probably do know what the hormone is. So your, um, your body produces um, a hormone called glucagon that um, has, it works very much like epinephrine does, but it has some different effects. And I would wager, if I were guessing, that glucagon probably is involved in this, in this same process. I'm sorry? If there's glucose to be released. So glucagon works just like epinephrine. So it'll go to places where there's glycogen, cause glycogen to be broken down, and then released into the bloodstream. But if the liver, you know, if you're starving yourself to death, or the, the you can't get uh, the, the glycogen broken down uh, properly or fast enough, then um, this is going to kick in. I'm sorry. You know, I don't know. I think it is, but I don't know. So the two products, you don't need to know the names, but the two products are beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetone. Yes? So is that going to cause, is that going to decrease cholesterol production or does it still require? That's a, that's a good question. Actually, I get asked that question a lot because people look at this and say, hey, could I do this and take away uh, my cholesterol uh, levels? Um, my suspicion is it does influence cholesterol production a little bit. Okay, and I'll tell you why. All right, there's, I think there's some evidence for it, and the, the evidence I think for it is the Atkins diet. Because in the Atkins diet, you're going very low glucose, and what you're doing is you're probably moving this direction, pulling away from this guy instead of moving over here to this direction. And people on the Atkins do have lower cholesterol levels. Yeah, so that may very well be a factor. Um, depending on how seriously they, they approach that. Yeah. yeah. Is that a question? Or are you just waving? I 
Everybody's getting tired and hungry. When I get tired and hungry, I get grouchy. You don't want me to get grouchy. I'm not, I'm not trying to get you shut up. I'm, I'm just, it was a, a weak attempt at a joke, not a very good, very good attempt. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> so I'll repeat the question, and the question was: If I were to write another one of those theoretical twenty-two point questions, would it be on new material or would it be on uh, something from the old exam? And the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is if I were to do that, it would be from either one or the other. Yes. Does that help? No. <laughs> so I will say this, and I, I think I said this in class. If not, I'll say it in TV land for everybody to watch it. Um, on the final exam, number one, I haven't figured, I haven't decided how many points yet. It typically ends up being about 150 to 180 points, and so I scale it to make it appropriate for the percentage, the 40 percent um, uh, of the total. And the other thing I tend to do is I tend not to have quite as much in the way of longer answer questions on the final because everybody's in a rush to get out and the grading and their longer exams and so forth. So there will be longer answer, but there won't be twice as many long answer uh, questions. I, I, can, I can tell you that much. Yeah? You'll have 110 minutes, almost two hours, which is, uh, which is slightly more than twice as much time because you get 50 minutes for the regular class. So as I said, I will be in my office um, on Monday 